You're listening to Have the Nerve, a podcast by Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. For this episode, we discuss catheterization from types of technique, the dreaded urinary tract infections, considerations when going out, and what to think about when it comes to intimacy. My name is Edwina Spooner. I'm one of the clinical nurse consultants working with Coloplast. So I've been nursing for over 20 years um, and seen a variety of things in my time. Coloplast develops products and services for people who require urology and continence care. This is one of two episodes about continence care. We're releasing them at the same time, so you can feel free to listen to the episode that's most relevant to you or listen to both. Um, For this episode, we're going to talk about some things that are actually quite graphic and a little bit uncomfortable for some people. A lot of people find this to be a little bit confronting. We're talking about bladder care for this episode, and it's a subject that not a lot of people actually know about spinal cord injury, and not a lot of people are actually familiar with the depths that it can go to, one of them being bladder care and bladder management. Yeah, so I didn't know if you wanted me to start off a little bit why um, the bladder is affected with a spinal cord injury. Basically, what happens is they end up with what's called a neurogenic bladder, so basically the filling and the emptying the bladder actually isn't working properly. So it either needs to be emptied or, you know, sorted out from um, an outside perspective. So it doesn't do it on its own. Um, Obviously, symptoms depend on where the actual injury occurs and how severe it is. So looking at different types of catheters, there's a couple of different options that people can look at. So an intermittent catheter basically is a... Um, basically, it's a thin hollow tube. It's inserted into the bladder via the urethra. So that's that little tube that obviously goes from the bladder to the outside of the body, drains the bladder of urine, and then the catheter is actually removed. Um, we actually do advocate single use because that's where all the current research is going. So we do recommend just using a catheter once and throwing it in the bin. A suprapubic catheter um, requires surgery, so it requires a surgical procedure where they basically make an opening in the abdomen and they create like a, an artificial urethra. So they create somewhere, an access where you can insert a tube that's changed every six to 12 weeks depending, um, which actually drains the urine from the bladder. So they're not draining urethrally or through that little tube coming between their legs. The other one is an indwelling catheter. So a superpubic catheter is more a very long-term solution. An indwelling catheter is generally a short-term solution. So right at the beginning of someone's injury, they'll generally have an indwelling catheter. So that's similar to an intermittent catheter in that it goes in the same place. So it's going in that urethra, which is going from obviously the outside of the body to the bladder, but it's held in place by a little balloon. So the nurse or or doctor will actually insert the catheter and then they'll put some sterile water in a little balloon, which holds it in place and holds it in the bladder. So they generally have that um, certainly at the beginning of their injury until they decide what their long-term bladder management solution will be. Okay. And so what could be some of the onset problems for somebody with a spinal cord injury um, immediately after the injury itself and later on? So just in regards to the bladder, um, spinal shock is something that everyone goes through after an acute spinal cord injury. Varies from person to person, can actually last up to about three months. So usually in this time, what happens is the nerves are really affected. So often they have no muscle tone. So if you think about the bladder, it's a muscle, okay, that contracts to push the urine out. So they have a lot of problems with that loss of muscle tone and people generally become unconscious, you know, not not conscious that the bladder is actually filling up with urine. So what happens is those nerve cells are interrupted. So generally in a normal bladder, what happens is... um, your urine fills up your bladder, it hits a certain point of your bladder and then it sends a message to your brain to say, hey, look, your bladder's getting full, you need to find a toilet. And then that message gets sent back. Unfortunately, when you have a spinal cord injury, that message doesn't always get through. So you're not always aware that you have to actually empty your bladder. So often people have to actually empty it using a device like an intermittent catheter. Everyone's different. Yeah. So it really is a unique position for everybody and everybody will have a experience when it comes to it. Um, You did mention that intermittent catheterization is preferred. What happens though if somebody is high level spinal cord injury and has limited hand movement, 
would it still be possible for them to be able to do intermittent catheterization? Yeah, I, I think the, the choice of catheter really comes down to an individual um, decision and individual, it depends on lifestyle, depends on, um, you know, what, what they're, they're going to be back into into the real world. So there's no one or solution that fits everybody. I think certainly with a high level injury, um, if people do have maybe some impaired hand function, an intermittent catheter is possible if there's a carer to assist them or if there's devices to be able to assist them to do it, them to do it. However, at the end of the day, it comes down to a, v- a very individual thing. I think at the moment, they tend to, the high injuries, they tend to just put a super pubic catheter in because it, it's a lot safer. Okay, okay. So um, when we're talking about types of catheters and the types of catheters that you can get, when I was younger they used to talk about glass catheters which obviously they, they, they do they yes, do they? they really do wow yep. okay then yep there's still quite a lot of clients that come by that that are still using a glass catheter interesting interesting so can you just take us through the types of material that actually make up catheters and and um what really is the difference between them and how people use them and why would they prefer one over the top of the other for example there, there, there is thousands of materials that they can use. So some are silicon, some are plastic, some are PVC. Um, it, it just depends exactly what they're made of. Some are impregnated with silver to reduce infections. Um, so there's all there's a whole host of different um, different materials that are used in making a catheter. You can have types of catheters like coated uh, and uncoated. Why would one choose one over the other? And why couldn't you just, for example, have all of them coated? Are they coated with a certain type of substance? Yeah. So I, I think um, one of the biggest things is is we really advocate hydrophilic coated catheters. So basically in fancy terms, that means it's got a slippery surface. So it's a catheter that stays lubricated on the way in and on the way out. So basically you don't have to add anything to, to it. It's It's all ready to go. The idea of a hydrophilic is to reduce friction. So um, if you can imagine inserting a catheter that doesn't have any lubrication, the risk of you know doing a little bit of urethral trauma can be there. So it really reduces that risk. Um, the other thing it actually does in the hydrophilic is they don't have to add lubricant to it. So you can imagine when you're doing a catheter, you have to open the catheter, put lubricant on it. You've already kind of almost touched the catheter, so you've potentially contaminated it with bacteria that then you're going to push up into your bladder having said that really good technique is probably your biggest key as to whatever catheter you're using um so really really good hand washing you really do need to wipe around the entrance to the urethra whether it's um obviously in a male you would have to pull the foreskin back clean around the tip of the penis before doing your catheter females obviously you'd have to um open the labia and clean around the entrance to the urethra before doing a catheter hydrophilic really is where we tend to like and sit the biggest barrier to this one i would say would be cost so if you're looking at an uncoated nelaton catheter um so similar to probably what you would get in hospital they cost about a dollar a catheter that's that's hydrophilic that's coated that's ready to go is anywhere between four and five dollars so if you have someone who is maybe self-funding or buying their own that's a significant cost The National Disability Insurance Scheme, or NDIS, was legislated in 2013. This gave people with disabilities more of an opportunity to access better quality catheters that is better for overall health. Because when the NDIS is rolled out, it's given people the choice to use a catheter that suits their lifestyle, whether it suits them and it makes it easier for them to go out, it's a little bit more discreet, it's a little bit easier to use. Um, So they've actually had that option to make a decision not necessarily based on cost but based on what suits their lifestyle. So so that's probably the biggest game changer in Australia has been the rollout of the NDIS. Yeah, we have um a few staff members who use who have found that the NDIS has made a significant difference for them and previous had been self-funded and they also use different types of catheters in different types of situations. So Yes, I think you're right. The NDIS has certainly made leaps and bounds for people with disabilities in that way, where even to the point where you might have been restricting yourself to the number of catheters you were purchasing before the NDIS, which is terrible to say, but true. Um, And now under the Mm -hmm. NDIS, you're able to get 
the, the actual amount of catheters you were probably supposed to be using to begin with. Absolutely. And and I think that's the big thing is that um, the, the cost is a, is a huge, you know, huge thing for people. So we've really got mm. to be conscious of that one. So, you know, it's mm. not always practical mm. for someone who maybe is buying their own catheters to actually be able to afford a, a product like this. You know, there are alternatives. We have some, you know, some companies have ones that are a little bit more affordable that have the gel already in them and you just squeeze the little packet and that's ready to go. There's other ones where you add water to the catheter and that activates a coating. Um, so there's lots of different um, different types of things available and we can always tailor something to someone's um, someone's finances. Yeah, um, you touched briefly on good technique and good technique for men and women. Um, is there anything that both men and women should keep in mind when it comes to actually catheterizing around good techniques? So not just hand washing. Um, you know, we might have people who, who yeah, forget to even hand wash or, you know, would there be hand washing and then they obviously touch their wheelchair and then they have to, you know, if they're doing it from the toilet themselves and they start cross-contaminating all over again, is there anything they have to keep in mind? Yeah, look, um, as you said, hand washing is the biggest one. Um, honestly, it, it's one of the best things you can do is hand washing. Um, if, if need to, it makes it easier, you know, keep a little thing of sanitizer near you as well, which can be just as, as um, useful um, when there's no access to soap and water. Um, I think the other big thing is um, sticking to a routine. So if you think about it, you know, every couple of hours you should be emptying your bladder because that's that's naturally what you do anyway. So we like people to stick to a really good routine. So every three to four hours during the day, they need to be emptying their bladder. Um, what that also does is it reduces the chance of bacteria growing on any leftover urine that's kind of sitting in there. The other thing is making sure you're emptying your bladder completely. So when you're doing your catheter, inserting it nice and cleanly, as I said, cleaning before you go in. Um, once you've got your catheter in, give it a minute to stop draining. When it stops draining, you pull it out a tiny bit and making sure you're emptying all the way down that neck of the bladder. So you're emptying the whole bladder and not leaving anything in there. And then obviously very slowly withdrawing. Uh, one of the other big thing is making sure you're drinking lots of water. So I'd say one and a half to two litres a day. It's very easy for me to say drink one and a half to two litres of water a day. It is really hard to do. Uh, I've actually found myself that I have, when I get up, I have a glass of water. After I've had a shower, I have a glass of water. So I've almost built, built it into my day. Uh, another thing that can really be helpful is getting an app on your phone um, or putting a um, reminder in your alarm just so every couple of hours you know um, that's when you've got to empty your bladder. And, and it helps you plan your day a little bit as well. Let's talk about the gold standard of bladder care. Obviously, we've got cleanliness. We've got uh, wiping. Um, I've been told in the past by some people that uh, continence nurses a long time ago had said to some ladies that you use three wipes every time you go to the to the bathroom. Um, is there is there still quite similar things to that? Because this is this is techniques that people have been saying for like 20 years ago 30 years ago so so in regards to gold standard when they're talking about intermittent catheters i think the big thing is that we're talking about mimicking close to what um, a normal bladder would do um so there's no nothing left in the body um when you have a catheter that's left in the body there's a much higher chance of bacteria tracking up that catheter and causing an infection um, among other things so um that's probably the best thing in regards to, to gold standard because it's closest to what we would be doing naturally. So essentially, um, look, urologists around the world have, have, have looked at it and said, yeah, this is really the, the gold standard because you're emptying the bladder as close to naturally as possible. Um, you're not having the, the point where you're overfilling your bladder because when you your bladder is too full, what happens is that urine pushes back up into kidneys and can actually cause permanent damage. Um, so, and, and it's really associated with the lowest risk of infection. We've spoken about many things already, and this is just one specific area of continence. Hygiene right from the beginning, wiping technique, catheter technique. Have you got the right catheters? Do you drink enough water? How much are these catheters? It can become quite exhausting. 
And then you have that extra layer on top, something that we've all had at some stage, urinary tract infections. Yeah, let's touch on um, urinary tract infections because this is something that obviously hits everybody who uses a catheter at one stage or another. Could have been accidental. You could have not really thought about drinking a lot of water. Are there other things there that could trigger off a urinary tract infection? Yeah, look, I think... um... Urinary tract infections are definitely one of the main issues that people with a spinal cord injury or people who are doing intermittent catheters um, have to consider, or even catheters in general. Um, so urinary tract infections are still more common in suprapubic catheters as well as um, urethral, as well as indwelling ones. But in regards to in- intermittent catheters, it is shown to be when people have a good technique, the lowest risk of developing a UTI. Um, loads of things we can do in regards to preventing them. Um I think everyone probably knows the symptoms anyway. Um, So, you know, fever, a little bit of a temperature, um, not that you'd feel pain when you're urine, but it might be a little bit smelly or a little bit cloudy. Um, Sometimes people can get a little bit confused as well, especially the older population. Um, You'll find now a lot of GPs are actually only treating, treating them when they're symptomatic, which basically means they may have bacteria in their, their bladder and, and no symptoms. So they actually usually won't treat them. Lots of different treatments in regards to that. Best things you can do to reduce your chance of getting a UTI, maintaining really good fluid intake. So one and a half to two litres of fluid. Try and keep your urine down to about 400 mils, the volume down to about 400 mils. So basically that means doing it, you know, four to six times a day. So every couple of hours, really making sure you're emptying your bladder really good hygiene, both genital and hand washing really, really well. Um, As we said, again and again and again, good technique. Um, And a hydrophilic coated catheter can actually reduce it because it causes less friction um, between the catheter and urethra. So um, that can actually be associated as well with reducing your risk of a urine infection. Is there anything somebody with a suprapubic catheter can do if they trigger off a UTI that way? Yeah, look, loads of different treatments. And obviously, this would be done in conjunction with your GP or your urologist. But there's loads of things like um, some microbial bladder flushes um, seem to have a little bit of an effect. Obviously, antibiotics is is one of your biggest treatments for UTIs. But as, as people go along and have multiple UTIs, unfortunately, what happens is they develop a little bit of a resistance. So the bacteria in the bladder Um, will actually develop a resistance to those antibiotics. So you'll find as time goes on, you generally need stronger and stronger antibiotics. And that's where things like bladder flushes can actually help. Um, There's a lot of current research looking at things like probiotics in in regards to reducing your risk of infection and also things like demanitose and other solutions that can actually help reduce that risk of getting an infection. I also have a couple of patients that swear by some of the catheters that have silver impregnated. So silver is essentially an antibacterial. It, it's really hard and it really comes down to the individual and you working in conjunction with your urologist and your doctor to find out what the best solution and best treatment is for you and, and the best preventative. Yeah, so what is a microbladder flush? <laughs> 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 so there's different, there's different solutions you can get so it can happen a couple, happen a couple of ways um, if people have really resistant bacteria essentially what happens is they get a specific solution and there's lots of companies that make them that they would actually then draw up into a syringe push into their bladder they could either leave it there for a little while or pull it straight out. So essentially almost flushing the bladder out. That can actually then almost um, clean out the bladder, so hopefully reduce the infection. People can um, who do an intermittent catheter can still do this as well. You just insert the catheter and then, as I said, pop that solution, little syringe, squeeze it up into your bladder, whether you leave it there for a little while or whether you pull it straight out, and that's that's how you do a bladder flush. Yet again, done in conjunction with your urologist or your you know your um, GP. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm just I'm learning new things all the time now. And there's lots of um, really exciting research coming out in regards to UTI management. So definitely, you know, check out some of the great stuff. I mean, I know some of the doctors from Prince of Wales did a really good one on um, probiotics, which is just a fascinating read. Um, and, and really probably just the tip of the iceberg of what's, what's available there. So I'm going to go through with you a few things, like a few situations where um, it's not your usual home and it, or it's not your usual situation. 
or it's we're talking mainly spinal cord injury for people who are adults but um what should people keep in mind uh, maybe parents for example or even or even the children themselves if your child is catheterizing and they're going to school for example Mm. I think um, this can be. Sorry, I've got a dog here. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> sorry. No. <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> so I think um, in regards to kids, I teach and train a lot of children. You would be amazed at what children can do at five and six in regards to their own catheters and being really independent. There's some really great tools that we have. We have. I know there's little gorgeous books. Um, that are specifically for, you know, tailored towards, you know, younger girls and younger boys in regards to catheters. I think the biggest thing is just technique. So it's ex- exactly the same again, washing hands, cleaning around the genitals and having a really good technique, doing it regularly. Generally when kids are at the younger years of primary school, there's a couple of different options. If they're at a private school, um, depending, um, we can actually, you know, there's companies and and lovely places out there that can actually coordinate training of teachers to assist with catheters and and all that. Or sometimes what you might find is parents in the beginning are coming in. By about seven or eight or nine, they're really doing it themselves. So some schools will actually have an allowance for giving them a, a proper disabled toilet to catheterize in, which just gives them a little bit more space. A lot of the catheters we have, you know, we can have a little sticky dot that sticks to the wall. And um, so we kind of teach and train kids around working around all these obstacles, catheterising at a friend's house, you know, catheterising when they go out, what to do in a public toilet. Because let's be honest, public toilets can be pretty vulgar um, at times. Public toilets are terrible. I don't know whether sometimes I would want to sit on them. So there's like things like catheters with a bag attached to them that they can actually learn to use. Um, and, and yet again, they can be built into their plan if they're funded. Um, so things like that where they actually won't then have to sit on the toilet and potentially contaminate everything by touching a, a gross seat or, you know, mm. not a particularly hygienic area. So lots that we can do. Um I do a lot of education with parents as well, just in regards to teaching really good technique. There's great videos to watch, um, talking about the importance of certainly wiping the genitals, washing the hands, all those kinds of things. Just reiterate all that stuff regularly, um, doing it regularly, so lots of routine. You did touch on something that I think all of us, no matter what age, who are catheterizing, which is the state of a public bathroom or when you're going out. People may, who've been intermittently catheterizing their entire life may not actually know what it's like to use a bag, for example, or, you know, even consider it going out. Yeah. So so in regards to the intermittent catheter, it, it's actually attached to a bag. So what it is, it's all in one. So it's the actual catheter and it's actually attached to the bag. So You do the intermittent catheter as normal, so you're cleaning around, wiping around the outside, um, inserting the catheter and the urine drains into that bag. It's all contained and then obviously removing it and it all stays in the bag. So they actually don't need a toilet to catheterise. And how how much does it it fill up to? And and is the catheter actually longer? And is there um, a risk of of leaking, for example, when you're going out or or, um, anything like that you need to keep in mind? Yeah, so the catheter's not longer. Um, There's loads of different companies that make it. Obviously, I work for Coloplast and the one that we make um, holds 750 mils, which is a pretty decent wee. Um, But there's lots of other products on the market that have catheters with bags attached. Totally depends on each um, each individual situation, where their spinal cord injury is, whether they're having leaking in between or not. Everyone's a little bit different. Some people find if they're having a little bit of leaking, they either have to wear a, maybe a pad or there's things for males that you can get like condom catheters. So basically sits like a condom and just drains any dribbling or any leakage into a bag. Generally, people doing intermittent catheters um, shouldn't really be leaking in between if they're not overfilling their bladder and they're doing it regularly. Yeah, right. And what about um, women who are pregnant and catheterizing? Because this is obviously quite different. You have to deal with, you know, the weight of the baby, the baby growing, um, 
uh, have you come across uh, what sort of stages of catheterization actually have to take place with a pregnancy? Shouldn't shouldn't really be any difference in regards to being pregnant because um, you're still emptying your bladder normally anyway, if, even if you don't have a spinal cord injury or a neurogenic bladder. Um, so there's really nothing different in regards to that. In regards to periods, um, generally what they suggest is if you're catheterising when you've got your periods, you really should um, remove your tampon reduces the risk of also contaminating anything as well um, and, and good hygiene. And what about sex and catheterization? So it comes down to when you've got a super pubic catheter having sex, you can get little bands that um, will just cover it, like a band just to cover the catheter, make it a little bit more intimate, but obviously no difference in regards to what's below the belt. Um, an indwelling catheter can be a little bit more tricky. So that's that catheter that's left in place through the urethra. Um, If you're a female, often what they do is they hold it up and you can tape it on the tummy, Um, so tape it up out of the way. And then with a male, what you'll do is actually pop a condom over the top Um, and that actually folds in in a way, um, tucks the catheter in quite nicely. In regards to intermittent catheterisation, essentially it's a normal sex life. So because you've got the catheter that comes in, comes out and gets thrown in the bin, it's a normal sex life. What we recommend, though, is before having sex is empty your bladder. Um, so do a catheter before you have sex um, and afterwards as well and just make sure really, really good hygiene. Mm, very important. Yeah, good tips. Um, we had somebody yesterday ask a question that I'm going to put to you now. Somebody asked that we had somebody who, who uses suprapubic catheter um, and they were talking about how... You have a flip flow valve, which I think would be good for you to explain, um, and or an indwelling catheter with a bag. Um, and they have found that the flip flow valve um, it drains directly into the toilet, but it's it never seems to be long enough to reach the toilet, um, and it's hard to flip with limited hand function. So they had switched to an indwelling bag, and they had found that their bladder had basically shrunk and doesn't actually hold urine anymore and they just wanted to know because they use you know overnight bags so they don't have to go to the bathroom often to drain is there any advancements in that sort of technology for people who either prefer to use a flip flow but have limited hand function slash it's too small or is there something there that can help them basically increase their bladder size again Yeah, I think the the best solution in that regard would be actually connecting it to a bag. So having the flip flow valve so they could actually connect a bag on and drain the bladder into a bag and then close the flip flow, disconnect it and then empty the bag whenever they have a chance or empty them when they're they're over a toilet. So into a, you know, into a bag and then close it instead of having to empty it over a toilet or having to reach to empty it over a toilet. So that could be an option as well. There's definitely solutions around everything. Any of your nurses that I'm sure people come in touch with would be very happy to sit down and find a solution that suits the individual. And I guess when it comes to advancements in technology for catheterization in that sort of area, there's nothing at the moment that can be really advanced. I mean, apart from, I guess, the flip flow valve itself could be longer, so it would be able to reach the toilet a bit better so maybe that would be a better alternative is that actually do you know if if there's any talks about that being extended or have you had any feedback from people who have said I want to use it but I can't absolutely absolutely and you know what and if you're not happy with something go researching and and maybe get a second opinion or there may be something that comes out all the time. You know, as you said, technology changes all the time. There could be something that comes out that you think, wow, this is actually a great solution for me now. So so just keep looking and, and find the best solution that suits you. And I think that's what it's all about. So if people just ask, keep asking questions and keep identifying, you know, this is where I want improvement on, there'll always be a solution. Well, thank you very much for this part, Edwina. Uh, We'll be moving on to part two in the next recording. But yes, thank you very much for your time. Oh, look, thank you so much for having me. I think um, the thing I actually love about my job is that the bladder and the bowel are such a, it's such a um, solution that we can really work with people to try and get them into that, into a situation that that really makes them feel comfortable with it. So we, we all need to get rid of it. The body is amazing in that you know, it essentially cleans itself. So the urine is liquid waste. 
who is actually solid waste. So yeah, it's it's such a um, such a simple thing to be able to help people with. You've been listening to Have the Nerve, a podcast by Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. If you would like to know more about what we've discussed in this episode, please check the show notes for details and visit scia.org.au for more information. As mentioned earlier, this podcast is one of two episodes about continence health. We would love to continue the conversation. If you have anything you would like to ask, drop us a comment on our forum at scia.org.au forward slash forum or email us at community at scia.org.au. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please consider giving us a five-star review. Your review will help us get the word out there. And finally, we're also on social media. You can find Spinal Cord Injuries Australia on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thank you for listening.